I am the um, Executive Director of the International Council of Science and I'd like to immediately thank the uh, Argentinian Council for International Relations uh, for the opportunity to come uh, to uh, speak to you all tonight about uh, a new initiative that we have been developing with a number of partners called Future Earth on research for uh, global sustainability. But um, just before I start with that, I thought I would say just a few words about ICSU, the International Council for Science. Uh, our president, Professor Lee, has already been uh, introduced to you because I'm not sure how well uh, ICSU is known uh, amongst your membership. So just a, uh, so just a few words on uh, ICSU to start with. Uh, we were formed in uh, 1931, and we are a membership organisation. We have 120 uh, national members, mainly National Academies of Science and other similar organisations, um, together with 31 <coughs> international disciplinary scientific unions, like the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry and the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. And together, we work towards the mission that I'm showing on this slide, strengthening international science for the benefit of society. So for us, scientific excellence is important, that we are strengthening that excellence, and that excellence has a purpose. It's there to provide uh, benefits uh, from, uh, for society at large. And our vision is all about uh, working towards a world where science is used for the benefit of all, excellence in science is valued and scientific knowledge is effectively linked to policy making. And in such a world, universal, universal and equitable access to scientific data and information is a reality and all countries have scientific capacity to use these. So that's our vision. And lastly, our main, or our three strategic priorities cover, first of all, international interdisciplinary research programs. This is an area perhaps we're best known for. We sponsor programs like the World Climate Research Program and the International Geosphere Biosphere Program that bring together scientists from across the world in those cases to work on global environmental change. Secondly, we work at the science and policy interface. So for example, uh, over the last year and a half or so, we worked on the preparation for the uh, scientific community's input to the Rio Plus 20 uh, conference on uh, sustainable development. Um, we also, uh, through our programs, have helped to create the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is uh, an equivalent to the IPCC the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, particularly with, in this case with biodiversity and ecosystem services in mind. And the third area that we work in is what we call the universality of science. So the ability for scientists around the world to be able to conduct science freely but also recognise the responsibilities that they have and also to make sure that the scientific data that they produce is as far as possible freely available and exchanged across national boundaries. So hopefully that has given you a little taster of what uh, of what ICSU is about. We used to, somebody I think I think Chair you already mentioned that the um, what's that extra U at the end of our uh, end of our name? We used to be called the International Council of Scientific Unions. We're now the International Council of Science, but the term ICSU was so well known that it has uh, that it has stuck. So let me go on to talk about a, a new 10-year initiative on research for global sustainability that we are developing. And when I say we, this is actually being it's being developed by ICSU, but together with an alliance, of part, an alliance of partners, and that coming together, which I'll talk about a little bit later, between um, a number of important international groups working on environmental change, is quite important to the way that um, future, Earth, future Earth will operate. So what's the backdrop? Why has uh, Future Earth been uh, developed? Well, I think in part, 
it's at, um, at least, uh, or at least in part, associated with the understanding that we're moving into a new geological era, which some people call the Anthropocene. The recognition that the human footprint, that human actions um, in terms of uh, our impact on the climate system, in terms of biodiversity loss, in terms of polluting uh, the oceans, in terms of resource use, are having a clear footprint uh, on, uh, on the Earth system, um, with uh, some, uh, concerning, uh, some concerning effects. And um, it's this generation of scientific community and the, society, and the society more broadly that has recognized this, but also has the opportunity to help create the knowledge required to respond for, the, for society today, but also for future, uh, for future generations to come. Now, a lot of that scientific understanding, and I'll give you a few examples of some of the pieces of scientific research that have been done, which are probably quite familiar to you already, have been done under the auspices of a set of international global environmental change programs that ICSU sponsors or ICSU co-sponsors. The first of those was created in the early 80s, the World Climate Research Programme, which is sponsored together with the World Meteorological Organization and uh, its equivalent for, uh, for oceanography. Then the International Geosphere or Ionosphere Programme, then Diversitas, which focuses on biodiversity, and most uh, recently the International Human Dimensions Programme. And they've come together in a partnership called the Earth System Science, Earth System Science Partnership. One of the critical things that these international global environmental change programs are able to do is work directly with the international research community to inspire and excite them around common, uh, common areas of interest so that you really build a community on a, a, an international, transnational basis which is of such importance to areas like environmental change that doesn't particularly uh, recognise uh, scientifically, uh, national boundaries. Just looking at um, some examples of some of the work that's come from these communities and from others in the uh, last months and years, um, this report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on uh, extreme weather events was published a few months ago. And um, it shows that over the coming um, century, more or less all of the scenarios that we typically use that um, the uh, hot weather days in most parts of the world will increase significantly in their uh, frequency over the period of uh, the century. Severe, you know, I'm talking about uh, uh, severely hot days. And similarly in terms of uh, days with severe rainfall, again for most parts of the world are the most emission scenarios and for the higher emission scenarios the situation is even uh, even more significant. Again, an expectation of uh, higher incidence of high rainfall events. I think the other, the other interesting part about this is that you know, that is, uh, those are projections, but the observational data, so what we've been able to observe over the last years, already starts to, uh, already starts to show these trends. Secondly, uh, a piece of data from industry, which I mean, is going to be too small for you to be able to read, but this comes from the reinsurance industry, in this case from Munich Re, and shows over time, you know, time along, uh, time along this axis, um, the trend in uh, major insured losses. The red line at the bottom are the earthquakes and volcanoes, the uh, solid earth geohazards, where you don't see any particular trend and you wouldn't expect any. But in terms of the losses associated with what I would call hydrometeorology, those areas associated in some way with the climate system, there's already a fairly clear signature over the last few decades of uh, an increase in insured losses. And a third area, a piece of work very recently published under the auspices of Diversitas, that's the International Programme on Biodiversity, um, showed what you might think of as quite a simple result, but it's a very important one. It's based on lots and lots of different experiments 
looking at the relationship between how well ecosystems function, so how well um, soils are regulated, the climate system is regulated, uh, fresh water is provided, fresh air and so on, with um, the biodiversity, the range of different taxa and species in our environment. And what it shows is over a whole range of uh, species and taxa that as you decrease the biodiversity, and that's exactly what we're doing uh, as a population in general, that ecosystem function, the health of our ecosystems, uh, degrades as well. This is a very important result because we all rely on a range of ecosystem services uh, in our daily, daily lives. Typically we don't value them, but we uh, often treat them as, uh, as free goods, but they're very, very important. To our, uh, to, our sustain, to, our sustain, to our sustainability. Now, that's some of the work that's been done so far, but I think there's a broader recognition now that society is facing a range of sustainability challenges going forward. Be it in the future about how we're going to feed 9 million people within the sustainable planetary boundaries of what the Earth system can provide, how do we value and protect those, uh, those ecosystem services that I was talking about earlier? Um, how do we adapt to a warmer and more open world? What are the options for transitioning to a low carbon society? There are a whole range of uh, environmental and sustainability challenges that we're facing. Many of these, of course, were recognized at the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. Uh, some of us, maybe all of us, I don't know, uh, will be disappointed in the political outcome of that meeting in terms of not, uh, from my perspective, responding to the urgency uh, that was required in terms of the scientific evidence. But yet again in the outcome document, uh, Rio Plus 20 recognised the role of science and technology and recognised that if we're going to have sustainable development goals in the future that they have to be science-based. So it is another call from the, from, from the scientific community for new knowledge and for the application of existing knowledge to be able to respond to some of these challenges. I've shown you some of the, uh, just a few pieces of uh, research that have already been done. Uh, what are some of the challenges going forward? Because they're not all the same as uh, work that's been done, to, done so far. The first is uh, a reminder for me that some of the areas that some people take for granted about environmental change are really not actually resolved. This is a uh, performance <coughs> of an um, ocean buoy, and it's a sequence of ocean buoys that run across the Atlantic to measure the strength of the Gulf Stream. Many of you may have heard about uh, concerns about that if the uh, Arctic continues to melt, and those of you watching the news will have seen uh, NASA reporting a few days ago that uh, Arctic sea ice loss this year is at an all-time uh, record, uh, record low, that will change the salinity structure of the ocean, change uh, ocean circulation patterns, and potentially change uh, what some people refer to as the Gulf Stream. But really, the scientific evidence is not, uh, is not clear on this. And the only way to really get a handle on it beyond the uh, predictive models that don't particularly show uh, this trend in a strong way is to get out there and observe the system. So for the last few years, and for a number of years going forward, the sequence of boys has been measuring the strength of the ocean circulation, or the relevant ocean circulation in the Atlantic. And what it shows you is that the situation is a lot more complex than some people think. It's very noisy, it's highly variable uh, between years. So where people, including from my own previous organisations, have taken spot measurements, a measurement this year, a measurement ten years before, and so on, and tried to draw a, uh, tried to draw a trend, in fact that trend is in, within the natural variability of the system. So as we go forward there are still basic scientific questions about the variability of the system. But secondly and thirdly, there are major new areas of investigation that need to be undertaken. I think one of the main points about Future Earth is the natural science community have done a great job at moving the alarm bells, but we must much more strongly bring in the social science community, the uh, economists, 
the engineers, the legal specialists and so on to much more clearly understand the social dimensions associated with sustainable, with sustainable development and, and, um, so, and uh, societal change. Sec thirdly, this particular example is from a survey of a number of U US states of uh, governmental organizations responsible for taking decisions on adaptation, adaptation to climate and environmental change. And these were the points that those officials found as barriers to doing anything about, to, uh, to doing any adaptation. And some of the key ones for them were all about problems with the state of scientific knowledge. Lack of information at the relevant scales. How do we deal with global data when we're actually making decisions on regional and local scales? Is it even scientifically possible to provide the regional and local scale data? Is it beyond the level of predictability? Secondly, how to handle uncertainty? And thirdly, uh, that the uh, information isn't yet ready uh, in, the, uh, in the forms that people are needing for it. So there are a number of areas where new information is needed. And that is really why a group of organisations, and I, I mentioned this alliance earlier, have come together to say we need a new initiative on research for global sustainability uh, called Future Earth. It's a group that brings together our organisation, the International Council for Science, with the International Social Science Council, as representatives of the international science community. The Belmont Forum and International Group of Funding Agencies for Global Change Research as the major funders in this area and a group of UN organisations, UNESCO, the United Nations Environment Programme, the World Meteorological Organisation, as organisations on an international level that need, uh, that need this information and also, particularly in the case of the World Meteorological Organisation, have particular skills in making information available in forms that, uh, in forms that people can use. Why now? Well, uh, maybe I've talked about this enough already and uh, this slide is a little bit small to, uh, to look at. But apart from all the points that I've raised already, why now? Well, we think there is a growing sense of urgency to respond. If you look at the trends in a whole range of environmental factors, be it water use, be it urbanisation, be it paper use, they, are all in, uh, they have all increased dramatically over the last few decades. We are putting tremendous pressure on the Earth system and some scientists, and that's what's represented on the right hand side, say this is a critical point because in some areas, particularly question marks about biodiversity loss and the operation of the nitrogen cycle, scientists are questioning are we approaching, are we moving past safe planetary boundaries for uh, the, the stability of uh, the Earth system and its, and its relationship with society. So Future Earth, what's it about? Well, the goal of the program is to provide the knowledge required for societies in the world to face the risks posed by global environmental change and to seize opportunities in the transition to global sustainability. And in simple terms, it wants to, the program is being designed to be able to answer questions like how and why the global environment is changing, what are the likely future changes, what are the implications are for human well-being and other species, and then important, particularly importantly, what choices can be made now to reduce harmful risks and vulnerabilities and enhance resilience, and how can this knowledge help support decisions and sustainable development. So it is action and uh, solution orientated. The initiative absolutely builds on those international global environmental change programs that I talked about earlier, but it's pressing us to work uh, in an even more aggressive way. I think some of the key words are on this slide. The one, or the two that maybe are most important to me are, first of all, mo more integrated. That means we have to bring the range of scientific disciplines and beyond the scientific community that are needed together to work together to be able to respond uh, to some of these challenges. The natural scientists, the social scientists, the engineers, and so on. And secondly, I'm just going to highlight a couple of these points. The programme is highlighting the idea of co-design. When we are designing 
the research priorities and how the research is going to be undertaken. We need to involve the potential beneficiaries of that research in that initial design process. If the outcomes of the research are going to increase the chances that the outcomes of that research is going to be more responsive to societal needs and the grand challenges associated with sustainability. The initiative is, uh, over the last year or so, and by the end of this calendar year, has been designed by a transition team. They are global change scientists, uh, natural scientists, social scientists, sponsored UN organisations from all over the world. Um, they're chaired by Professor Diana Liverman from the University of Arizona and Professor Johan Rockström from the uh, Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Resilience Centre. And they are charged with doing uh, three things plus one. They are putting together an initial research framework. They are setting out how the initiative is going to work. They're setting out an engagement strategy for communities beyond the program. And the plus one is that they're thinking about a name for the initiative. And I've given the game away because I've already told you it's called Future Earth. But I have to say that whilst there's lots of challenges in this work, the one thing that was gratefully received was a name for a program that wasn't an acronym. Because everywhere else in our program, we're suffering under IGBPs, WCRPs, and, uh, and all sorts. And it's great to have, uh, it's great to have an actual, uh, an actual word, word. Anyway, small things, uh, small things please uh, my small mind. So, that, um, if I just, before I can, you know, bring this talk to a conclusion, it, just to say a few words about that research framework. It's based on a, a conceptual structure which is shown on this diagram, which links uh, my phone again? human activities and uh, human development with regional and global environmental changes, with the impact that those changes have on people and societies, our responses, and then the identification of possible trajectories towards uh, global sustainability, which then leads back to more human actions and uh, development of human society. The complexity of this is that all of these are interacting at a whole range of different scales. Um, local, regional and global scales on a, plan on a uh, planetary basis, but also each of these components uh, interact with each other. So it's, uh, I think as uh, you all know, it is a, a not trivial problem to, uh, to set out, but we are using this structure of that set of relationships to help us define a set of research themes for the programme to work on. And those themes, um, I put them up on this slide, cover areas like the state of the planet. So observing and understanding what the current state of planet Earth is and how we predict it to evolve going forward. Secondly, we want to understand and evaluate the effectiveness of current responses to uh, global environmental change. Third, and this is very topical at the moment being here in uh, Buenos Aires because there is a very exciting uh, workshop next week on uh, disaster risk reduction which can feed straight into these debates. It's a question of how do we anticipate global thresholds, how do we improve resilience and reduce disaster risk. The fourth area has particularly uh, natural resources and natural resource security in mind and the link to uh, development. So how within the context of sustainability and what the Earth system can, can provide, can we provide the knowledge for sustainable, secure and fair stewardship of food, water, health, energy, uh, materials and other ecosystem services. The fifth is about uh, pivotal places, key parts of the Earth system which play an absolutely critical role in, uh, in sustainability, be they uh, cities and the number of cities over the planet is expected to rise dramatically over the coming century, um, forests, the polar regions and so on. The sixth recognises the importance of the oceans. As my oceanography friends often say to me, why on earth do we call it planet Earth where 70% of it is actually covered by water? Uh, wouldn't planet ocean be a rather more, uh, rather more appropriate term? But the oceans provide an absolutely critical part of the 
of uh, an absolutely critical part of the Earth system. You know, we often talk about uh, the Amazon and so on as the, uh, one of the lungs of the Earth system, of course, the uh, biological life of the oceans, the phytoplankton, and are, uh, are, its other lung, are its other lung. And the seventh, seventh theme is to look into the longer term and think about and test what are the possible transformative pathways, what are the possible approaches that can be taken towards a more sustainable future. I won't go into them now, but each of these themes has a, a first set of research questions to look at, for example, on oceans. What's the capacity of oceans to take up CO2? How do we govern sustainable fisheries? And, uh, and so on. And at the moment, this research framework is going out into the community for it to be tested, for it to get feedback, and uh, for it to be developed further. And again, uh, with this region in uh, mind, there'll be a, a regional consultation, I think, in, uh, again, hosted by our regional office, which will be in Mexico, which will be in Mexico in, uh, in, uh, in December. Now, to go with those themes, there is a recognition that there are a whole set of cross-cutting capabilities that are needed to be able to deliver this research, but they're bigger than any one research program can provide. What Future Earth hopes to do is to work in partnership with other organisations like the Group on Earth Observation or those centres that provide high-performance computing and data curation to make sure that by working together we can establish what the entire uh, community needs. So, um, just to finish up, where are we now? Well, Future Earth was launched at a major conference in London called Planet Under Pressure and uh, then in particular at uh, Rio Plus 20. Some activities have already started, so the International Environmental Research Funders have already started to create opportunities for scientists not just in one country, as they typically do, but on a transnational basis to work together. Their first opportunities were on coastal regions and on water security. The International Social Science Council is already getting going uh, with programs uh, as part of Future Earth. But whilst this is going on, because those are sort of early kickoff activities, we are going out into the research community and to our stakeholders now to better design uh, this research framework. So, I think that brings my uh, introduction to uh, Future Earth to a conclusion. Please, if you're interested, first of all, I hope you can uh, discuss the debate a little bit now. But if you're interested in further information, do take a look um, at the ICSU website, www.icsu.org, where you'll also find much more information about our programmes. Thank you all very much indeed for your attention. <laughs>